Act Two of Pride and Prejudice, a play by Mary Keith Medbury McKay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conservatory or Orangery at Netherfield. On one side, an archway, approached by two or three steps and hung with curtains, separates the orangery from the ballroom on the opposite side is a smaller archway with curtains which are looped back giving a glimpse of the drawing-room beyond there is another door on the right bingley is discovered directing two footmen who are putting a bench in place darcy stands watching them a little more to the right martin that will do push those lights farther back behind the trees yes that is better looking about him i think that is all you may go the men leave the room well darcy do you approve of the arrangements have you anything to suggest any criticisms i have no criticisms for the arrangements <laughs> but you have for the ball yes i know still i was really obliged to keep my promise i am glad to find that a promise is with you an obligation oh come darcy i understand set your mind at rest i am going to london with you although i must say i do not see the necessity for it I think you are exaggerating the effect of any small attention of mine toward Miss Bennet. However, we will cling together and fly a common danger. Common danger? Yes, common danger. I too have eyes. Where will you match the wit and vivacity of Miss Elizabeth Bennet? She is indeed charming, and I admit that were it not for the inferiority of her connections, I might be in some danger. But they form, for me, an insurmountable barrier against any possible peril love laughs at bars darcy darcy looks annoyed no i won't it really is not fair since it is my fault you would never have been put to the test if you hadn't been so good as to stay on here with me after that stopping suddenly and with an entire change from his former bantering tone he says in a hesitating manner darcy do you really think you should be silent about wickham decidedly i do not choose to lay my private affairs before the world but the fellow was sailing under false colours you do not know what the result may be. I really must speak of this again, Darcy, even at the risk of offending you. Darcy makes an impatient gesture. I am truly concerned at the foothold this rascal has already gained in the Bennet family. What he has failed to accomplish once, he may succeed in again. These young ladies have no brother to defend them. Neither have they the wealth to excite Wickham's cupidity. At any rate, I do not wish to be the one to enlighten the neighbourhood. Besides, I understand that he has left Meryton even so i he is interrupted by miss bingley who enters gaily from the drawing-room ah here you are to darcy will you be so kind she holds out her arm for him to clasp her bracelet your sister georgiana should be here mr darcy to her brother charles you should have insisted on her coming i am not in the habit of insisting with darcy laughingly very true to Darcy, who has at length succeeded in fastening the bracelet. Thank you. Looking about her. It is vastly pretty, Charles, but I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball will be rather a punishment than a pleasure. <laughs> if you mean Darcy, he may go to bed if he pleases, before it begins. But, Charles, it would certainly be more rational if conversation instead of dancing were made the order of the day much more rational my dear caroline but it would not be near so much like a ball entering to mr bingley several of the carriages have arrived sir and the guests will soon be entering the ballroom to the footmen very well to miss bingley come caroline we must be at our post we will leave darcy to make up his mind whether he will join us later bingley and his sister disappear through the archway leading to the ballroom darcy does not follow them but walks thoughtfully up and down the room the sound of a voice is heard announcing mrs long the miss longs a pause colonel foster and mr denny a pause mr and mrs golding a pause mrs bennett the miss bennett darcy stops in his walk and goes towards the ballroom archway then he walks once more up and down mrs king miss king darcy again moves towards the ballroom he lifts the curtain hesitates looks in then disappears sir william and lady lucas miss lucas 
Mr. Robinson. The music now begins. The stage is left empty. After a short pause, Elizabeth and Charlotte appear between the curtains of the ballroom archway. Peepson then enters. Isn't this pretty? Come in here for a moment, Eliza. I want to tell you something. Following her. Why did I promise to dance with Mr. Darcy just now? Why did I not have more presence of mind? They sit on the bench together while they talk. The guests at the back pass to and from the drawing-room in the ballroom, and the sound of the music is heard faintly. I dare say you will find him very agreeable. Heaven forbid! That would be the greatest misfortune of all. To find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate, do not wish me such an evil. I wouldn't be a simpleton, Eliza. You are angry because Wickham is not here. But I wouldn't allow my fancy for him to make me unpleasant in the eyes of a man of ten times his consequence. My fancy for Wickham, as you choose to call it, is simply my sympathy for a most ill-used man, also the relief of meeting with good manners and a good understanding after the insufferable pride of Mr. Darcy, and the stupid pomposity of that dreadful Mr. Collins. Charlotte starts. Oh, my dear Charlotte, I have never thanked you half enough for helping us to endure that man. It was so good-natured in you to sacrifice yourself by listening to those interminable speeches of his. I am more obliged to you than I can express. But, oh, what a relief it is to know that he is really gone! Who has listened to this tirade in increasing embarrassment? Oh, don't! Don't, Eliza! You are making it so terribly hard for me. But—but I must tell you— I am engaged to Mr. Collins. Elizabeth is stupefied with surprise, and looks at Charlotte for a moment in silent and incredulous amazement. Then, with difficulty, she speaks. Engaged? Engaged to—to to Mr. Collins? Oh, my dear Charlotte, impossible! You are joking. No, indeed, Eliza. I am in most serious earnest. Why should you be so surprised? Do you think it incredible that Mr. Collins should be able to procure any woman's good opinion, because he was not so happy as to succeed with you? Oh, no! No, of course not! And—and you must forgive all I have just said. I, I couldn't possibly have imagined. No, Eliza. Indeed you could not. She puts her hand on Elizabeth's shoulder. And we shall be friends still. Why, of course, of course, dear Charlotte, it was only the—the the surprise. You know how fond I am of you. You know I wish you all imaginable happiness. Yes, I am sure of it. You must be surprised, very much surprised, so lately as Mr. Collins was wishing to marry you. But, dear Eliza, when you have had time to think it all over, I hope you will be satisfied with what I have done. I am not romantic. I ask only a comfortable home, and considering Mr. Collins' situation in life, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. Undoubtedly. Looking at Elizabeth affectionately and wistfully. And you will come to visit me sometimes. I could not bear to lose you, Eliza. Surely, Charlotte. Looking up and patting Charlotte's hand. We are to be cousins, you know. Why, so we are. Colonel Forster comes from the ballroom. Lydia and Denny enter from the drawing room. Hurriedly going to Charlotte. I am to have the honor of this reel, I believe, Miss Lucas. Oh, yes, Colonel Forster. She goes out with Forster, leaving Elizabeth alone, still seated. Lydia and Denny approach Elizabeth. I think we are being treated abominably ill, Lizzie. It seems that Mr. Wickham has gone off on business somewhere, so he will not be here at all. Lydia looks off towards the ballroom. Aside to Elizabeth significantly. I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now if he had not wished to avoid a certain gentleman. Suddenly. Why, Mr. Denny, I do believe the reel is half over. I dearly love a reel. We shall miss it altogether. Come. She drags Denny off. Alone. Well, well. The world is surely upside down. Charlotte and Collins. What a match. Approaching from the ballroom. 
do you not feel a great inclination miss bennet to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel elizabeth makes no answer do you not enjoy the reel miss bennet looking up oh i heard you before but i could not immediately determine what to say in reply you wanted me i know to say yes that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste but i always delight in overthrowing that kind of scheme i have therefore made up my mind to tell you that i do not want to dance a reel at all and now despise me if you dare smiling i do not dare miss bingley enters from the ballroom with an officer they talk together entering from the ballroom and looking about him sees elizabeth and comes to her may i have the honour miss bennet i do not dance the reel colonel forster oh the reel is over this is our dance she goes off with colonel forster darcy remains where elizabeth leaves him and watches her till she disappears into the ballroom the officer bows and leaves miss bingley approaching darcy i can guess the subject of your reverie i should imagine not you are considering how insufferable it would be to pass many evenings in church society indeed i am quite of your opinion i was never more annoyed the insipidity and yet the noise to nothingness and yet to self-importance of all these people who would i give to hear your strictures in them your conjecture is totally wrong i assure you my mind was more agreeably engaged i was meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can bestow looking at him very meaningfully and sweetly speaks with coquetry indeed and will not you tell me what lady has the credit in inspiring such reflections with great intepetry miss elizabeth bennet taken aback miss elizabeth bennet i am a lastinish how long has she been such a favourite pray when i am to wish you joy that is exactly the question which i expected you to ask a lady's imagination is very rapid it jumps from admiration to love from love to matrimony in a moment i knew you would be wishing me joy now if you are so serious about it i shall consider the matter as absolutely settled you will have a charming mother-in-law of course she will always be at pemberley with you perhaps you might give a few hints as to the advantage of holding her tongue thank you have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity oh yes will the portrait of your uncle de attorney be placed next to your great uncle the judge they aren't the same profession you know only in different lines as for your elizabeth's picture you must not attempt to have it taken for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes it would not be easy indeed to catch their expression but their colour and shape and the eyelashes so remarkably fine might be copied oh i fear not elizabeth and colonel forster with others enter from the ballroom miss bennet with lady lucas from the drawing-room here comes the fair one seen mrs bennet and mamma in law as well all that intrude in a family party she goes off laughing and mingles with the guests colonel forster bows and leaves elizabeth with her mother bingley enters with jane from the drawing-room he sees darcy who is standing where mrs bingley left him and comes to him i thought this next dance was the one you liked so much darcy let me find you a partner starting as if in a reverie uh, so it is thank you i have a partner he goes to elizabeth bows and they go into the ballroom together mrs bennet and mrs long follow them looking after darcy with a smile turns to jane you must be tired miss bennet i propose that we sit quietly through this dance do you agree yes indeed she sits on the bench it will be very pleasant looking about her how very prettily you have arranged all the rooms mr bingley i'm so glad you think so i fear they were rather inconvenient for so large a party oh i find them delightful you are always charitable miss bennet it seems to me you always manage to see the best side of everything i never knew you to say an ill word about a person or a place smiling oh i fear that is not quite exact i only try to see things in their best light perhaps that is just it the rest of us rarely try to see things in that way so you see i have proved my case you are too amiable not for tonight mr bingley everybody is of one mind tonight there is but one point of view 
You are giving nothing but pleasure. I wish it were so, but, dear Miss Bennet, I wish to tell you. I must tell you. He's interrupted by the people coming in again from the dance. Darcy and Elizabeth enter with Sir William Lucas and others. Bingley and Jane rise from their seats and walk slowly towards the back of the room. Darcy escorts Elizabeth to a seat and stands by her. Both are silent for a moment. It is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some kind of remark on the size of the rooms, or the number of couples. Smiling. I assure you I will say whatever you wish. Very well, that reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. Do you talk by rule, then? Sometimes. One must speak a little, as you know, and yet for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged that they may have the trouble of saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you are gratifying mine? Both. For I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room, and be handed down to posterity with all the éclat of a proverb. This is no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure. How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I shall not decide on my own performance. There is a short silence. Then, as if with an effort, Elizabeth speaks. I am surprised not to see Mr. Wickham here to-night. I find that he is a great favourite with the officers. He has made many friends among them. With great hauteur. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. They both are silent. Coming up to them all urbanly and smiles. What a charming amusement for young people this dancing is, Mr. Darcy. I consider it one of the first refinements of Polish societies. Certainly, sir, and it has the advantage also of being in vogue amongst the less polished societies of the world. Every savage can dance. Smiling. Do you often dance at Sir James's? Never, sir. You have a house in town, I conclude. Mr. Darcy bows, but does not speak. I had once some thoughts of fixing in town myself, but did not feel quite certain that the air of London would agree with Lady Lucas. Darcy bows in silence again. Elizabeth is amused. But I must not further interrupt you, sir. I only wish to tell you once more how highly gratified I have been by your superior dancing. Allow me also to say that your fair partner does not disgrace you. It is a great pleasure to see you together. I must hope, too, to have this pleasure often repeated, especially when a certain desirable event, my dear Miss Eliza. Glancing at Bingley and Jane, who are talking earnestly together at the back of the scene. Shall take place. What congratulations will then flow in? But let me not interrupt you. You will not thank me, Mr. Darcy, for detaining you from the bewitching converse of that young lady, whose bright eyes are also embracing me. Murmurs to himself. So. Looking earnestly at Bingley and Jane, he seems much impressed by what Sir William has said. Elizabeth notices this. Recovering himself, Darcy turns to her again. Sir William's interruption has made me forget what we were talking of. I do not think we were speaking at all. Sir William could not have interrupted any two people who had less to say for themselves. We have tried two or three subjects already without success, and what we are to talk of next I cannot imagine. Smiling. What think you of books? Books? Oh, no. I am sure we never read the same, or not with the same feelings. I am sorry you think so, but if that be the case, there can at least be no want of subject. We may compare our different opinions of them. No, I cannot talk of books at a ball. My head is always full of something else. The present always occupies you in such scenes, does it? Yes, always. I remember hearing you once say, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was unappeasable. You were very cautious, I suppose, as to its being created. I am and never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice. I hope not. It is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion 
to be secure of judging properly at first may i ask to what these questions lead merely to the illustration of your character i am trying to make it out and what is your success shaking her head i do not get on at all i hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly i can readily believe that reports may vary greatly with respect to me and i could wish miss bennet that you were not to sketch my character at the present moment as there is reason to fear that the performance would reflect no credit on either but if i do not take your likeness now i may never have another opportunity i would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours miss bingley enters from the ballroom she comes directly to darcy and elizabeth oh mr darcy would you be so good as to go to charles he wishes very much to consult you about some of the table arrangements you will find him in the dining parlour that is if miss bennet will permit you oh certainly darcy bows and goes out to elizabeth after a moment's silence so miss bennet i hear that you were quite delighted with george wickham he must have told you all a pretty tale as to mrs darcy is using him ill it is perfectly false i do not know the particulars but i do know that george wickham has treated mr darcy in a most infamous manner his coming into the county at all is a most insolent thing i feel very strongly on this point miss bennet as mr darcy's interests are so intimately associated with our own she watches elizabeth we hope miss georgiana darcy may some day be my sister my brother admires her greatly ah uh. yes and therefore we resent this falsehood and this presumption on the part of george wickham but really considering his descent we cannot expect much better he has evidently forgotten to tell you that he is just son of old wickham steward to the late mr darcy his guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same i have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than of being the son of mr darcy's steward and of that i can assure you he informed me himself with a sneer oh i beg your pardon excuse my interference it was kindly meant she goes out insolent girl you are much mistaken if you expect to influence me by such a paltry attack as this i see nothing in it but your own wilful ignorance and the malice of mr darcy footmen now come in with small tables which they place about the stage bingley comes in and directs them Darcy follows him. To Elizabeth, Jane, his sister, and others who have entered. I thought it would be pleasant to have some of the tables here. To Jane. We must have places together. With some bustle, all seat themselves. At the table on one side are seated Darcy, Elizabeth, Bingley, and Jane. A little behind them are Miss Bingley with Colonel Forster, Charlotte Lucas with an officer. At the table on the opposite side is Mrs. Bennet with Sir William and Lady Lucas behind them are more tables at which other guests are seated entering with denny much excited goes to mrs bennet mamma have you heard the news mr denny has just told me that the regiment is to leave meryton and go to brighton good heavens what is to become of us mamma sympathetically are they really going well my love it is too bad i know how you feel i'm sure i cried for two days together when colonel miller's regiment went away five and twenty years ago i thought i should have broken my heart i am sure i shall break mine mamma might we not all go to brighton oh if we only could but i fear your father will not hear of it oh papa is so disagreeable i am sure a little sea-bathing would set me up for ever wouldn't it mr denny surely miss lydia oh you must manage it in some way they move off and take their places at one of the tables looking after them well lady lucas it is hard for a lively young girl like my lydia to be cooped up in a place where there is so little going on however looking at bingley and jane we are not likely to have it so very dull in the future in a loud whisper to lady lucas you know what i mean nudging her and laughing jane and bingley ah indeed with importance in a still louder tone 
oh yes it is quite settled such a charming young man a netherfield only three miles from longbourn and jane's marrying will be a fine thing for my other girls they will be sure to meet other rich men who will fall in love with them who has heard the beginning of this conversation makes a pretext to go to arrange her mother's scarf and says in low tones oh mamma be careful i beg mr darcy can hear you what is mr darcy to me pray that i should be afraid of him i am sure we owe him no such particular civility as to be obliged to say nothing he may not like to hear for heaven's sake mamma speak lower what advantage can it be to you to offend mr darcy you will never recommend yourself to his friend by so doing that is enough lizzie i think i can take care of myself i never knew before that it was a crime to speak to one's friend about what everybody can see plainly enough who has eyes in his head turning to sir william did you sir william smiling our friends usually have very sharp eyes for what is going on mrs bennet significantly i have indeed sometimes expected that you would observe what has been going on in our household of late going on what has been going on sir william with an important air it is only this mrs bennet that lady lucas and myself have to ask your congratulations on our very great satisfaction in a recent engagement of our daughter charlotte charlotte engaged why who in the world is going to marry her sir william draws himself up with offended dignity lady lucas bridles the gentleman whom my daughter has honoured with her hand is your husband's cousin mr collins rising in rage and amazement mr collins marry your charlotte good lord sir william how can you tell such a story do you not know that mr collins is going to marry my lizzie or or one of my other girls well really mrs bennet what i have told you is quite true nevertheless mrs bennet the whole matter was settled before mr collins returned to hunsford i am sorry we are not to receive your good wishes oh but you are sir william charlotte has already told me all about her engagement and we shall be most happy to welcome her as a cousin mollified him with gallantry thank you miss elizabeth i am sure other congratulations will shortly be in order he glances significantly at darcy elizabeth draws herself up sir william smiling makes a little bow then turns to the table where he and lady lucas busy themselves with their supper to elizabeth so charlotte has told you has she i don't believe a word of it oh mamma i'm sure mr collins has been taken in well i trust they will never be happy together and i hope the match will be broken off mamma turning on elizabeth in a rage and you are the cause of this whole mischief lizzie i think i have been barbarously used by you all while this conversation has been going on the other guests have been taking their supper colonel forster now rises with a glass of wine in his hand ladies and gentlemen the buzz of conversation ceases ladies and gentlemen i should like to propose the health of mr bingley mr, mr. Bingley. Mr. bingley raising his glass to mr bingley may the pleasure which he has given us all to-night be but a foretaste of the future happiness which he will both receive and give in this community mr bingley mr. colonel mr. forster mr bingley mr bingley mr bingley all drink as bingley bows rising and may i be allowed to still further express the sentiments of this community by proposing another toast in which i am sure you will all join me with enthusiasm raising his glass to the master of netherfield may he retain that title from his present fortunate youth to his future green and honoured old age drinking mr bingley sir william mr bingley rising ladies and gentlemen friends hear hear i i really cannot tell you how much i am touched by the very kind words of colonel forrester and sir william and and i only wish that i deserved them embarrassed and looking towards darcy who with folded arms is staring at the ceiling no i do not i i did not like to speak of such a painful thing on an occasion like this and so i have told no one of the fact that i am about to to leave netherfield leave, leave netherfield, netherfield. Oh. 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 still more ill at ease 
Yes, it is a very sudden decision, but but important interests have made it necessary for me to to leave Netherfield. But only for a time, Mr. Bingley. Let us hope it will only be a, a temporary separation. Why, surely, Mr. Bingley, you will be back again very soon? No, no. I'm afraid my returning at all is extremely uncertain. In fact, I, I expect to leave Netherfield permanently. Great consternation. Jane looks down. Elizabeth looks at Darcy. Miss Bingley has a triumphant smile. Oh, my dear Mr. Bingley. This is indeed a calamity. To Elizabeth. Good Lord, Lizzie. Poor Jane, what? Oh, hush, Mamma. Looks again at Darcy, who remains perfectly calm throughout this commotion. This time, the sight of him seems to make Bingley somewhat angry, and he pulls himself together and speaks in a firmer tone and in a more cheerful manner. But, my friends, nobody knows what may happen. We shall undoubtedly all meet again sometime. And meanwhile, you must not let what I have said spoil your pleasure. The music is now heard again in the ballroom. There is the music. We must have another dance together. There is a general movement among the guests. Those at the back of the room begin to go into the ballroom. To Jane, Colonel Forster, and others near him. Let us make up a set here. I think there will be room. Capital idea. The footmen remove the tables. Oh, yes, capital. With meaning to Darcy. Do not you think so, Mr. Darcy? Darcy bows stiffly, without speaking. Miss Bingley may have the pleasure. She bows, looks daggers at Darcy, and takes her place in the dance. To Jane. Miss Bennet, will you grant me the happiness? Darcy gives him a look which Elizabeth sees. The, the final happiness of my stay at Netherfield. Curtsies, a tremor in her voice. Thank you. They begin to form a set with Miss Bingley and Colonel Forster, Lydia, and Denny. Crossing to Elizabeth. May I have the honour, Miss Elizabeth? Looking at him with Frank Hottier. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. I am indisposed. Darcy bows, reddens, and crosses to the other side of the room. The music begins. Amid embarrassed astonishment, Sir William and Charlotte Lucas fill the quadrille set. As the dance commences, Elizabeth and Darcy, standing at either side of the dancers, exchange a glance of keenest pride and prejudice. End of Act Two